Hello, my name is Jasmine Fuerta, and I'll be discussing and explaining my Lead of People lesson to you. What I'm going to be speaking about is Unit 3, Lesson 5, which is about how much power should be given to the executive and judicial branch. Now, when you think about it, it all comes down to the old system of checks and balances. But by your own knowledge, you should know that checks and balances is the system where the government even means distributes the power in the country. The main subjects I'll be talking about here are the powers that the Constitution gives to both the executive and judicial branches and how the legislative branch checks on both the executive and judicial branches. In addition, I'll be also talking about the electing of the president and how it is done. So let us get into it. Now we may think that the Constitution was created in the snap of a finger, but it was way more difficult than that. There were many challenges faced. Is it important that the commander in chief of the armed forces is also a civilian? Why? The president who is commander in chief should be seen as a civilian because even though they are in charge of the armed forces, they don't fight in it. A civilian is one who doesn't fight in the armed forces, and the president has to be seen as one of the people. So they're a civilian since they don't directly fight. The Constitution gives the executive certain powers because of too much power, then they can overtake the government. These powers are as listed. Make and sign laws passed by Congress, make treaties with foreign nations, appoint government officials, be commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and veto laws passed by Congress. Side note, they can also appoint and receive ambassadors to and from countries, and pardon people of any of their crimes, for example, U.S. versus Nixon. Why would the Constitution require the President and Congress to share the power when negotiating treaties with other nations? The President has the power to make treaties, but this has to be done with the advice and consent of Congress. This term basically means that this certain action cannot be done without the approval of Congress before it is done. This is done so that way Congress can check over the executive branch and make sure that their decision is not only benefiting the government, but also the country as well. The Constitution can give the branches power, but it can also limit them by involving other branches into the mix to even out the playing field when deciding on a plan. For example, when making treaties with other countries or appointing officials to the governmental office. To say more, the president, who is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, can't declare war. Only Congress can do that, to keep the power balanced between the branches and to not give one branch all of the power to lead the country into harmful situations. When a law is being passed, the president can veto the law if they think it can affect the country. But Congress still has a say with a two-thirds override. Why did the framers allow presidents the power to veto laws passed by Congress? The president was given the power to veto laws Congress wants to pass because they have the right to check and review any laws before they are put into place to make sure they are right for the country. Now, vetoing doesn't mean no, but it doesn't mean that the law can be a bad idea and might not work out. But on the other hand, Congress can still override this decision. When the Constitution was written, they made many ways to prevent the abuse of power. And one of these ways was by giving the House of Representatives the power to impeach the president. Now, to impeach means to bring someone to trial. To elaborate on that, this means that the House of Representatives can impeach the president for committing serious crimes. Now, if Congress wants to impeach the president, then the Senate will hold a trial. And then, if the president is found guilty, they will be removed, but this rarely happens. For example, this only happened to presidents Bill Clinton, Richard Nixon, Andrew Jackson, and our standing president, Donald Trump. This is a way to keep the executive branch in check. Why did the framers allow for the impeachment of presidents? This happened to prevent presidents from abusing their power and from taking control of the government. In the Constitution, it says that people have the right to abolish the president, and that's what this is. This helps keep the country stable and under the law at times. How should the president be elected? 
That was the real question the framers wanted answered when they needed someone to lead their new country. The first president of the United States was George Washington. And through the years, people said that the person next in office should have the qualities of George Washington. In the Constitution, it says that the president will stay in office for four years and will have the chance to be re-elected for another four years. Now being re-elected may sound fishy, but there was an amendment made to ensure this. That is Amendment 22 that says that the president can be re-elected into office. Now one guy named James Madison thought that the people wouldn't be as educated enough to pick a good president to be in office. So he asked the government to create the Electoral College, which this is a group of people from each state that come together to vote on who they think would be a good president. What qualification should a person have to become president of the United States? When becoming president, not anybody can just pick the job. There are certain qualifications, such as the one running has to be at least 35 years old, be born in the United States, which means they are a citizen, be a resident of the United States for 14 years, and they can be of any gender. The framers thought that if the president was elected by the legislative, then Congress would be in control of the president. But they also thought that if the state governments chose the president, then the states would control the president. So this resulted into the Electoral College. If the Electoral College ended up in a tie, then the House would make the final call. And each state would have the last vote. Now enough about the executive branch. Let's switch over to the judicial branch and learn about it. A country is not a country with issues to be solved and improved off of. Issues like between two or more citizens, state governments, or even the national government. They needed ways to solve these issues. So the framers created the judicial branch, which stated in Article 3 is the Supreme Court of the United States. There are many rules when it comes to being with the Supreme Court, like how justices have to be appointed and not elected, so this makes them independent when it comes to politics. Also, justices cannot be fired from their position, but they can be impeached if convicted of treason, bribery, or any other high crimes or misdemeanors. Another main fact is that they have appellate and original jurisdiction, which means that they get to hear cases first. Original jurisdiction means that the case goes straight to the Supreme Court, while appellate jurisdiction means that it's tried in a lower court and then moves up to the Supreme Court. Why do you think the framers wanted the Supreme Court justices to be appointed rather than elected? The framers thought that justices should be appointed, not elected, so that way they're not influenced by politics and can make decisions based off of their own understanding. When appointed, they make decisions based off of themselves and the Constitution. The judicial branch actually has the power to overrule state laws that violate the Constitution or any laws passed by Congress. This is based off of Article 5, the Supremacy Clause. Little thing to throw in here. If a state makes a law and then the government makes a law, the government's law will stand higher than the state's. Also, there was an issue that when it came to government, some people were scared of a very strong national government, but that's another topic. Now we needed a different type of government, other than Great Britain, because there our rights were violated. We didn't want to create an executive branch because we could have put ourselves in the situation of monarchy, and we didn't want that. We needed a branch that was powerful enough to carry out responsibilities, but not too powerful to overpower the other branches. Make and sign laws passed by Congress. Make treaties with foreign nations. Appoint government officials. Be commander in chief of the armed forces and veto laws passed by Congress. When making treaties with other countries or appointing officials to the governmental office. To say more, the president, who is the commander in chief of the armed forces, can't declare war. Only Congress can do that, to keep the power balanced between the branches and to not give one branch all of the power 
to lead the country into harmful situations. When a law is being passed, the president can veto the law if they think it can affect the country. But Congress still has a say with a two-thirds override. The United States Supreme Court has something called judicial review, which basically means that the court has the power to declare any laws by Congress or any state laws unconstitutional. I believe that justices should be impeached for committing any high crimes or misdemeanors so that way they can make decisions on cases without the fear of losing their job or getting fired. I believe that justices should be appointed rather than elected so that way they are not pushed into politics and so that way they can make decisions on cases without being influenced by politics and so they don't have to worry about what politics will say about their decision making. So overall, a little summary. The president and the judicial branch have limits and powers to create the perfect government that is for the people. Thank you for listening for about 10 minutes and I hope you learned something. Bye.